Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Rugby League Back Chat, filmed here at the Pitt Sports Bar in Chapel Allerton. Our three guests this week then, leading Rugby League agent Craig Harrison, Rugby League writer for the Sunday Times, Chris Irvine, and the shy and retiring Gary Schofield. Super 8s chaps, let's talk about the eight teams dining at the top table first. We'll find out this week the fixtures, but are you all excited, pumped as it would be in the Aussie vernacular that we're going to get seven rounds of top quality rugby league, Gary Schofield? Well, Stanley, to be honest with you, uh, you look at uh, top quality rugby league, I don't think we've had a lot of top quality rugby league in, up to round 23. If I'm honest with you from there, and everybody's still discussing what formula we're going to come with, what structure, you look at the top four, the top four even now looks as though it's still been done, and it's St. Helens have walked away with it, then we've got Wigan, we've got Warrington and Cass, and then the ones who are trying to get in there, uh, Catalans, Huddersfield, uh, the Wakefield and the black and whites, it looks as though maybe too much to do from there. But what I would say though is Catalans and Huddersfield, the way they are playing, they could give the, uh, the, the, uh, the Super 8s a real, real shake up because they, they are in great form. Can you see someone coming from outside the four then? Because many people are already saying it's between Saints are going to finish first, yeah. the other three can sort themselves out where they're going to finish. The only way that'll happen is if, uh, and I say, Cass, Warrington and Wigan, if they, their form goes, which I can't really see, to be honest with you, but Huddersfield and Catalans, they will give it a big shake-up. Hull have seen it this moment in time, they're gone. They are absolutely gone. And what people were saying about Hull, when they got knocked out of the Challenge Cup, we're going to the grand final. Boy, oh boy, aren't they on a big massive downhill slide when you look at their, uh, their performances over the last few weeks. Wakefield, well, they're in there now at the, this moment in time, making up the numbers. So Huddersfield, Catalan to form, what they are showing, may give it a bit of a shake-up, but overall at this moment in time, the top four, that's how it's going to finish. We'll have a word on every side in there throughout this first part, but just on the, on the seven games overall, Chris, are you sort of giddy getting ready to get there, getting to see some of these quality games to take you through to Old Trafford or not? Three words, every minute matters. Remember those? Well, we've got two months here that probably don't matter whatever in, in t before we get to the semi-finals. St Helens booked their uh, semi-final spot in the penultimate round of games. They're 10 points ahead. It's way, way, way in the distance. And it's just, just probably the three behind them scrabbling over that other home semi-final. Below those, there's such a gap in even Huddersfield, who finished fifth, I think they're about five points behind. They're still a long way. So it would, it would involve a, one of those clubs collapsing for, 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 for that four to be disrupted. So my worry for the Super 8, sort of like the qualifiers, but with the Super 8, it's going to be a rather potentially rather tedious eight, uh, eight, uh, seven weeks ahead of us. I'm asking this question very positively, Craig. I'm going to keep going. I'm after a, a positive answer. Are you looking forward to the fiesta of rugby that's going to be these seven games to see who gets us to the semi-finals in Old Trafford? Listen, I'm, I'm lucky. I go around looking. I think it's a chance for some of them. You mentioned some people to get an introduction into Super League. I think the four who were there will stay there, there's no doubt, because they'll pick the points up against the ones who were struggling for me. Where I think that... I, love the, I don't mind this time here, like I said, I think you can introduce somebody like these young talents, give them a chance, we're on about development, give them a chance, build up for the eights. I think it does diffuse the, the, the programme a bit because I think they're not, the, it's obvious now that the four will definitely stay as the four. I think about the players, I think a lot of them probably personally, the ones I speak to, if you're not involved in that four, it is definitely hard to motivate yourself to get up for a game on the following week. People say about professional passion, but I do feel some of them will, but I hope that gives the chance for the kids to get a chance. We get to see some young talents. That's what the game's about for me anyway. So It is, and although I agree with the essence of what you're saying, it's a rum job, isn't it? If the elite part of the elite competition is about giving young kids a chance at the back end of a season, this should be about the best players at the best clubs knocking seven bells out of each other and trying to get to grand finals, shouldn't it? Uh, they will do that eventually when it gets to fours. But for me, like I said, I, I love to see a young Jack Walker, a Truman. I love to see people like that come along. That's what it's all about. I, I get different perspective. If I see some good rugby, but I get to see some young talent come through and kids get a chance who normally wouldn't get a chance, then they can build up and keep the, str the strong. Yeah, I think it's maybe needs looking at. I think that bit maybe needs looking at. But for me, as I say, I'll still turn up and go to some exciting games to see some talent. I'll tell, tell you what, though, Craig, the, the fact of the matter is, when you look at the, the, the Murray go around, what's going on at Lee, for instance, young talent will not get an opportunity. I can, I can, I can reassure you from that. I know the representative what you have uh, with the players, but that, that, that ain't, that ain't going to happen because even now with the, we, we, uh, with the Super 8s, they're still playing for money for the top position from there. Mm. So the minute you go around what's going on at Lee, it's journeymen who are taking these young kids' places. It ain't going to happen. They're not going to put, they're not going to put the trust and the confidence of the young talent what we've got around because 
of the league position from there and also to a money value as well. In the bottom eight, you mean? You mean you're no, in, 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 in the Super 8s as well. Yeah. Okay. Wakefield, Hull, Oldersfield and, and Catalans, whichever league position there, it's, it's a monetary value as well. So they won't give these kids a chance. They won't use these as trial games because there's money from there and they won't, they won't give the kids an opportunity. Part of the problem as well is we know that, that, that Bar Leeds, the rest of the Super League clubs don't want the Super 8s anyway. So within that group of eight, there's eight clubs there who don't even want to be playing these Super 8s. Yeah. So that kind of, you know, diminishes the next the next two months in that respect and I agree you know it's a fantastic showcase if if young players can get there but uh, you know as Richard said it's right this should be the pinnacle of the season where it just feels a kind of flattening off and you get those repeat fixtures and it just feels just flat the system uh, we argued on this program many many years kind of leading into uh, the super breaks that it wouldn't work and all the kind of fears that we have then unfortunately seem to be to be um, coming to pass uh, the qualifiers I think are a different kettle of fish mm. uh, but for the super the so-called super eights super is the last word it really is I tell you what you, you mentioned that the, uh, the super eights there and then the qualifiers I tell you what the qualifiers are going to be more exciting than what the super eights are because you've got Toronto we've got Toulouse we've got London and then we've got Halifax boy oh boy do they want Leeds do they want Ulkiar? Do they want Salford? Do they want Windows? Because they will fancy themselves. Because when you look at the, uh, the Super League clubs in that bottom four, apart from Ulkiar, who are showing a bit of form, a bit of confidence, them championship clubs want to get ripped into them Super League clubs. That is going to be very, very exciting, the qualifiers. And I want to go through the qualifiers in depth in, in part two. I think it's very well worth a good 10 minutes of chewing over. If we, if we stick with the top eight for the time being, um, Saints, Wigan... Castleford, Warrington. If you played that now, that semi-final, that's decent, isn't it? I mean, that's four mm. sides who have played in the main, decent rugby league, played well. They're where they deserve to be because of how they've played. As much as we can look at the system, they are the best four teams yeah. in the competition. But we they? found that out over 23 rounds. Do we need to know over, over another seven rounds and keep flogging them to death? You know, we've got a Great Britain series at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, autumn. Um, yeah, they're the, the best sides. And St Helens are the standout side, just like Casford were uh, last year in terms of runaway. They've got, they've got a 10-point lead. It's a, an unbelievable lead. But as we know, that could mean nothing in the final analysis. And it meant nothing ultimately for Casford last year. I'll tell you what as well, when you, uh, when you look at them four sides, and uh, Craig mentioned the talent we're coming through, what I'm delighted with, certainly with the three coaches, Holbrook, with the opportunities to give Richardson this year, Sean Wayne, with Josh Woods at number seven from there, and then also too, Darryl Powell with Drake Truman, we, uh, with, with Truman from there at halfbacks. We need more of that. We need more of that. We need more trust in quality halfbacks, what we've got. We need more confidence to put in there, because I can tell you, I know exactly what will happen. The senior players... We'll respond to these young kids because they can organise and play with that vision and awareness and they will get a response. So well done to them top three coaches by giving opportunities to young kids who want to play week in and week out. They can handle the pressure and they're rewarding the coaches with their performances they're putting Are in. you saying that's a direct correlation to the club's success that the coaches have decided to do that? No two ways about it. No two ways about it whatsoever. Well done to them three coaches. I'd like to have seen a lot more of Declan Patton at Warrington but also to the brought in Tyler Roberts from there so... You know, hopefully next year uh, Declan Patton will get that opportunity of being the quality halfback what he is. I think we've, we've, well, Saints have unearthed a star in Danny Richardson, haven't they? I mean, the 55 metre penalty he struck to win the game against Wellington uh, at the weekend was uh, was fantastic. The composure and the authority of the kid, because really Tommy Makinson would have taken that. He's the long range penalty specialist, but he took the kick very confident and off the tee. I mean, it kept sailing. It almost sailed into the stands. It was a fantastic way for St Helens mm. to win, but just reflected the confidence of a 21-year-old who I think, and I'm sure Gary will agree here, should be part of that Great Britain squad in uh, the autumn. Hey, listen, uh, pe people keep going on, well, these 20-year-olds, these 21-year-olds, it's too early for them. It's an absolute load of rubbish. I'm just saying it to Craig before we came on from there. I was playing test football at 18 years of age against Mark Meninga and Gene Miles and Wally Lewis and Brett Kenny. Hey, listen, if these young kids are good enough, Look, they're old enough, it's as simple as that. Yeah, Gary, and, and, for Richardson, and for Richardson, because we know Luke Gale, on his days, he's, he's the best number seven from there, but Richardson is knocking on the door from there. Yeah. Why he wasn't included in the Denver test is beyond me. Because What I was hearing is that, well, there was a conversation between the England management and the St. Helens management saying, 
it's too early for him. The kid's 21 years of age. When's he going to make his, his CD in the dead? We're 26. Yeah. What do you, what, let's bring Craig in, because you obviously have a lot of young players on, on your books. Yeah. What do you make of the point of the young players flourishing in these top four sides? History tells you every time they get a chance. A friend of mine, John Bastian, uses the word patience all the time. Give them the time, give them the patience, they'll, they'll deliver. They always do. History tells you they always do. We've just mentioned Jack Walker played in the grand final at 17 years old. Jake Truman and them can still play 19 to Cameron Smith and Mikolai. You're on about Richardson's. He's two years older than Truman and Walker. Mm -hmm. So what are they going to be like? He was nowhere near where they are now. So God help you in two years' time, you'll see what will happen. Can you spoil them? Can you spoil them? No, 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 no. Because a good coach, like, let's say Pauli on Truman, he got Gailey coming back. He's got a big call to make. I actually said to Truman the other day, hopefully... He keeps his form, but Truby hopefully plays in a big game this year. Uh, there's a grand final, there's a semi-final. He deserves it with his performances. But there's going to be Benny Roberts coming back. He's got the choice on Ellis and Gailey will start. Gailey can't wait to come back because he's buzzing to, to play with Truby. He's saying to me, I, I can make him even better. We can do things here. So exciting times. I just hope that the kid, they keep the patient. They've got to have a lot of bottle, haven't they? You look at now, if you've got Truman and then you've got Roberts and you've got Ellis... The safe bet would be to play the others in the big game, but I didn't think I don't think the safe bet is. I think Troy's earned the right to play in that game, as Jack Walker did last year on form. That last five games, Jack Walker were the best fullback in the comp, and he proved it in the grand final. I'll tell you what, you, you talk about the safe bet there. I'll tell you what the safe bet is. Truman plays with Luke Gale. Yeah. It's as simple as that. You talk about with the big game. I saw him make his debut last year at Wigan. You know, absolutely run the show. Scored hat trick himself. It was just organising, getting playing with that vision and awareness. The senior players around him were responding very well because the one thing for sure there, and, and I say knowing Daniel has to do a little bit, he's put his trust in Truman. Mark my words, Truman and Luke Gale, what a hat pack partnership that is, by the way. And unfortunately, Roberts and Ellis still get dropped. And that's simple quite, as that. But, but it's always shown in the, in the history of rugby league, you know, give young kids a chance. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and that, look, we, we've just gone through a football World Cup in which the star was a 19 year old Frenchman, 19 we, years old. We, the big problem is, is usually it's by default. Sometimes these coaches claim that they've given them a chance. They aren't. As with Tompkins, that there's usually an injury or yeah. there's usually a lack of this and they have to play him. I'd love to think that a coach plays I mean, look, you, you take, a choice. Take Kevin, a choice. Take, take Kevin Sinfield. He, he kind of was nurtured under the wing of, of Yestin Harris and, and came through there from the age of 17. But the greatest players to play the game uh, in Super League. So, you, uh, what Craig is right about the Super 8s, maybe some further opportunities and that, that is to be applauded. You see, also, also as well, uh, again, and, and, and I've been an advocate for now for the last 20 years. Stop bringing journeymen from Australia and New Zealand over. There's loads of talent out there. Unfortunately, the way the game has got this moment in time, there's loads of 19-year-olds who've got loads of talent who have been thrown on the scrap heap. So one of the, one of the answers is quite simple. Forget the journeymen from Australia and New Zealand and give our talent the opportunity. I want to talk about the other four teams just behind. I say just, some of them are a bit further back than that. From what you've all said, I kind of get the feeling that you think that there's two categories, Huddersfield and Catalan, who maybe, just maybe, could upset the apple cart, and Wakefield and Hull, who are playing the season. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that what you're, is that what you're I, all I, feeling? I don't think that about Wakefield, because I think Wakefield showed last year what, what a good Super 8 side they were. They nearly, nearly got into the top four and finished fifth. And uh, Chris Chester was talking at the weekend about the importance of finished fifth. OK, it's only another 75,000. We say only. For him, he's saying that's a, that's a, that's a new player for him. Mm. So I think Wakefield under Chris Chester will, will, be, will, do, will probably do quite well in these. I'm worried about Hull. The way they've lost the last four calamitously at Wakefield and there seems to be something uh, you know, rather wrong there. Obviously, they've gone through an injury crisis, but the response of the players on the field has been poor. Certainly with, with the Catalans, they've got the semi-final coming up uh, this weekend from there, so decide what their season's going to be after that, whether they go to Wembley or not. The players, what they brought in, Kenny Edwards and Drinkwater, certainly you know, brought a uh, different dimension to them. I must say about Huddersfield as well, their coach in Wolford, I'll tell you what, what a response he's got from his players and what a quality app they've got as well. Even Oliver Russell, Mark my, my, my words, mind. he's a quality, he's a quality player as well. And also what Wolford has done, I've said it many, many times over the last couple of years, Lee Gaskell, I was asking the question, what sort of rugby league player is he? He was absolutely rubbish. 
Wolford coming in now, you want to see the response he's got from Gaskill. It's a Gaskill of all when he played with Johnny Lomax there. It's a yeah, but he's put him in the position he should be as a half stand-up. Exactly, but what yeah. he's done is put the confidence back in Gaskill. He's letting him play. He's letting him organise. Him and Bruffy, it's the ideal combination. Gaskill's taking charge for the first 10 or 15 minutes. Bruffy's taking over. And then that combination, when they're working together, it's great to watch as, a, as an ex-half-back myself. Huddersfield will give it a bit of shake. Depends on the Catalans, what they get for Wembley. But the other two, Hull and Wakefield, they've got the factor six on. They're going nowhere near the top four. Quick word from you on that, Craig. I think it'll stay as it is, 100%. Back to Chester, playing for 75 grand for one player. That's three play players at Wakey, not one. Um, <laughs> 100% stay as it is. Like I said, hope kids get a chance. Hope we get to see some great talent on show. The reason Huddersfield are playing well they are, by the way, is because the fitness guy as well has gone in and said, Oof, let's get the running back, let's go back old school. He's absolutely the vote. And then we mentioned before playing for places. Young Oliver Russell comes in, Gaskell's probably thought, aye, aye. I'm not going to get a game when I'm fit here because usually he just drops in at six out and all of a sudden the young ones met the old ones have to play. So it, it brings performances up all the way around. More on the way in part two. This young and these three oldens will be talking about the qualifiers and the Challenge Cup semi finals next. Hello and welcome back to part two of this week's Rugby League Back Chat here at the Pitt Sports Bar in Chapel Allerton. Super 8 still on the menu, I want to talk the qualifiers and what better place to start than with the man who's been awarded the freedom of the Borough of Ealing, he's got his Broncos underpants on right now and a cheque in his pocket for £1,000 for Michael Channing if social media is to be believed. London Broncos, Gary, are they the story of the qualifiers for you? Well, well with him for sure, he's not getting his £1,000 because uh, we're all entitled to a penny, aren't we? And uh, when I uh, went, uh, Henderson left uh, London from uh, there. Yeah, I'm delighted that Danny, uh, Danny got, got the job because he's served his apprenticeship very well, hasn't he? And I just felt as though London, mm, maybe, uh, you know, disontorated from there. And, uh, you know, Danny may struggle a little bit, but boy, oh boy, have they been have they been a quality side. And what they've got this year, well, they have maybe not got over the last few years, is consistency in the play from there. So well done to London. I know you gave me plenty of stick, you London fans, but uh, <laughs> well done to London. I'll tell you, they will give they will give the qualifiers a shake-up. There's no two ways about it. Toulouse, are they worthy of a mention? Chris's potential Super League club? Yeah, totally. I mean, um, I think you just look at that qualifiers and the fact that you've got Toronto, Toulouse and the Broncos in there, it just, it, it just feels, it just adds the air of excitement and, uh, and, and fresh feel to it. Uh, and Toulouse, fair play to them. They've, they've always had ambitions, haven't they, for a long time to kind of get themselves into that top flight. And now they have an opportunity. And I, I think if you had a second French club adding to the mix in Super League, how, how exciting would that be? That's what we're talking about, is, is, is possibly, if, if there's an air for change, if there's a real, we want to embrace change and development and moving this sport forward, then surely the likes of Toronto and Toulouse and London Broncos are part of that. And they're gonna feature for the next seven weeks in, we've talked in the first part about the Super 8, it's been a bit flat. There's no, no danger of that in the qualifiers, everything to play for, every minute matters. What about Halifax? Craig. Well, Marshall's done a fantastic job on here. Uh, I often wonder whether they should actually print what budget you're playing with. I think that'd be great to see. But people talk about who's the best coach. Well, come on then, you know, put, put what, what cap they've spent. I believe Marshall spent, as well as London, probably less than the other two by, uh, you know, by, by quite a bit. So I'd love to know what he's actually worked off to get where he's done. And he's got the best out of some older players, which I thought 
I thought the day had gone, but as, as Scott Morell showed, you know, in, in the games on telly, you know, they're still playing. Great, great. I've got a couple of lads there. They say it's fantastic atmosphere to be around. They all play for each other. There's no standout superstars. They're all just in it. You know, they know what each other's monies are. There's no one getting greedy. They, they, they probably will. I believe this time, I think Lee had a chance a couple of years ago to shock a couple when they got that good start and then it petered off. I believe one of them's going to come up. I have no doubt in my mind. I've got a feeling one of them four are going to come up. Would you be worried if you were at a Super League club going into into this, particularly, I'm guessing, Widnes, who were bottom by a long way and, and Salford just above them? Hey, listen, them Super League clubs very, uh, be very much worried, I'm telling you, because Toulouse, Halifax, London, and I say in Toronto, they are wanting the big boys. Rich, they are wanting the big boys, I can tell you what. And uh, certainly Leeds this week, you know, they got the semi-final from there and then they've got to come down to earth because them, them players and them clubs are looking to get ripped into them. Uh, they're looking to get ripped into Wilkinson, Rovers, Widnes and Salford. So, <sighs> I tell you, they better be very worried. And if they are not going to be prepared to put the body on the lines for the next seven weeks in these qualifiers, there's going to be a hell of a lot of shocks and surprises. I'd, I'll, I'll drop one in on that. The, I think I came on here last time and I said I thought that old KR had left a bit in the cap for this happening. The scary ones will be the ones who haven't left anything in the cap before, so they couldn't do it much on deadline day or before. And I've, I've watched the way Hull KR have been coming to form going into this, which I think that means that they'll, I think they'll be the form team in it, in my opinion. But I def desperately think if you haven't, and this has come as a shock, you look into your bodies, that's where one of these champions, they'll, they'll get you, they'll get you. The downside to this is, has been the rather unseemly spectacle of, of, of the vultures feasting on the bones of Lee Centurions and obviously Derek Beaumont announcing that he'll be leaving at the end of the season. And I think that's, that's a great shame because we're losing another, you know, a, a man with, with some money and a, and a bit of vision he had for Lee and, and, and the, Lee, the Lee dream for the time being has ended. I, I, I have not enjoyed that, the, the spectre of that, of that uh, you know, that feasting on, on, on the carcass. Really. Oh, Chris, to be honest, I don't think the, the vultures, I think they've just been total bad Of course they are, that's a bit of course they are. Of course you know, they, are. Let's not forget, they got a parachute payment of half a million pounds yep. to make sure they not only got in the four, but got themselves back in the Super League. So at the end of the day... But that's what the system does, doesn't it? It, it creates that thing where somebody's going to fall off the edge as well. And, and, and you've got to be worried about a witness, you've got to be worried about a Salford as well, well going into, into this. You know, the swings and roundabouts and those are the, those are the downsides. There's, there's no doubt about that, but one thing for sure, Hulky Rovers, who Craig has mentioned there, they've got two decent players, I would say, a young crooks, and also to Craig Hall, he scored two tries in the derby from there, so they've they've certainly benefited from there. But to be honest with you, Chris, I don't think anybody will have any sympathy for Lee because they've had the half million pound, they've had the best players, and again, I'm not blaming the coaching staff from there. We know their coach Dukes who got the sack from there. I'm not blaming the coaching staff. I'll tell you what, I'm blaming them players but because also, they have not been doing but it. But does week it in also not out. signal just how difficult it is to make that transition for an ambitious club who want to come up? how difficult it can be to actually do it. And, and Lee have gone up twice, uh, they've lasted one season, gone down, and, and we've had that kind of boom, bust, boom, bust, and we're in that kind of bust cycle with them yeah, again. Chris, when you, when you, when I don't you look, think the sport can afford When you looked at that squad, when you looked at them players, what did they lose about the first five or six games from there? Should never have happened. Cost the coach the job because, unfortunately, it looked as though they didn't want to play uh, for Dukesy from there. But them players have to, bla have to be blamed for putting Lee in the mess what they're in. Let me ask you this, and I'm paraphrasing someone who sits in this chair from time to time, Mr Studd, and his phrase, any outcome is possible, however unlikely. Can anybody around this table, and I'll start with you, Craig, see Leeds Rhinos being relegated? Wow. Um, I met Kevin yesterday, and you'd say what a job he's took on, hasn't he? You know, you think about winning to these eights and semi-final at Challenge Cup, if they get done... If they got done in the semi-final by a big score, then like Gary says, then going into a playoff situation, which they won't have the experience. Jimmy has. Jimmy's had a little bit of that. He lost a playoff with Bradford, didn't he? But Kevin's never experienced, probably as a coach, anything like this. A lot of them players are pretty young. Do I look around the changing room and see them leaders uh, like they've had before, where the young ones go, Phew. you know, I can remember Danny saying, JP, you don't have team talks. He just says, follow me and we'll knock that. It were on. You knew instantly. Uh, It'll definitely be character building. Do I see him? No, I think they've got enough quality. I think, I think, I think Singo and a couple of the, you know, that type, so that will get them through it. But I tell you what, you're going to be on a journey. I'm telling you now, you are going to be on a journey as a Leeds fan. Same question to you, Gary. <laughs> One thing for sure, you won't rule Leeds out being in the million pound game. 
don't rule Leeds out being that, uh, in that game because I'm not seeing no quality. I'm not seeing no leadership, and I'm sure Kevin has seen that as well. When you look at when you look at the last four performances, you know against Cass, Wakefield, Salford, and Witness, I said the last four games, you know, Cass and Wakefield wanted to send them in the bottom four. Salford and Witness wanted them in the bottom four. I'm not seeing any character. I'm not seeing no leadership. And one thing for sure, I am not seeing any quality. We've got the semi-final this week. If Warrington literally hammer them for the semi-final, then the pressure is on. Don't rule out Leeds being in a million pound game. I think at Leeds themselves that they are fully recognised of the fact that they could go down and they need to think that way. They need to get desperate. They need to fight. They need to struggle. They've got the advantage of four home games and that, and that, and that will help them. But, but as we've seen, you can be champions one year and you could conceivably down. Would, would, can, uh, c- could we survive Leeds, you know, arguably one of the, if not the biggest club in the game going down? I, I'm sure the game could, but, but it would, it's an intriguing scenario. And, and that's, the, that's the size of the task facing Sinfield and crew. And it, it's, it's, it's a fight. And one thing for sure as well is they've got four home games at Leeds. That crowd, they know now. They know they're under pressure. Can them Leeds players under that pressure? There'll be a hell of a massive pressure when they play at Edinley. And if the performances aren't going well for 60, 65 minutes, then fans will let them know. So now the other question is, can them Leeds players under the pressure of what them fans are going to put them under for the four home games? Toronto, are they a Super League club next year in your opinion? Um, I tried to think what the recruit would lay on and have they got enough to challenge. I thought they might have brought a couple in, so I'm thinking, you know, and they didn't really pull the trigger. Um, I I think Rowley's very confident as a person in it that he's probably thinking there's one or two of them Super League clubs going to get took out. I can remember a couple of years ago, coaches were picking the games they wanted to win. They put the stronger teams out on certain ones. They wanted to take the points to get them in. I've got a feeling that'll happen again. I think they'll target certain ones, maybe, depending on how it starts on them first games. They're certainly, if you win Toronto, it's, it's, that's a tough gig. It's a tough gig going to Toronto. I've heard all the stories all year about it. You know, I'm a massive advocate of Toronto. I want them in. But it is a tough gig you're going over there. I mean, the Super League, like, like, you know, they won't treat it as going like to Blackpool on a stag do. They're not going to go along and be seen at Toronto when waterfalls and going out for a restaurant meal. It'll be business. Uh, I think they might just be short. Uh, that's in my opinion. But I think, again, I'm sure it's depending on them first two games will be massive. Are you a bit torn on Toronto, Gary? Because... There's the expansion aspect, but a lot of their team are those journeymen you were racking off about in, in part one. So where do you sort of sit on the wolf pack? Well, they are genuine, aren't they? And to be honest with you, as, as we all know, if, um, if they do manage to get in Super League, then it'll be a different side. They know they need a better quality, so it's good to, I would imagine they'll make 10 or 30 new signings, won't they? You know, but at, at this moment in time, these journeymen who are at the Toronto, they're good enough to get into Super League. They are absolutely good enough. Hey, I'll tell you what as well. Craig mentioned the other about Halifax. Don't know about Halifax, you know, certainly when they're going to the share from there, and I, I, I very much like uh, Richard Marshall as a coach. I like the way that he plays, he gets the best out of the players. Hey, by the way, Leeds are looking for a new coach at the end of the season, I would imagine. Richard Marshall would be a bad shout, or Young Ford at York as well, by all accounts. But um, these four sides in the Championship, the way that Leeds, Witness and Salford and Oakies to Rovers are playing, Maybe take OKR out of that, because they're playing this moment in time pretty decent rugby league. But then four sides in the Championship, I'll tell you what, they will never have a better opportunity of making that million pound game or getting into Super League because of the way Widnes, Salford and Leeds are playing. Toronto, Toronto is really interesting because it taps into the civil strife in the, in, in the sport itself, isn't it? Because you've got super, certain Super League clubs and Rob Elston himself has, has talked about a degree of nervousness over that. He's called for due diligence for the future for Toronto. He knows that it's dependent on the mining magnate David Argyle and without that money that maybe Toronto wouldn't be um, you know, where they are. But, but saying that, you can say that about Ken David, Huddersfield and met many other clubs. But it does tap into that thing. I mean, the, the RFL are saying, look, if, they, if they're there in that top three or, or win the million pound game they're going up but I'm not sure all the other Super League clubs are going oh great oh Toronto are in and, it, and, and, and I tell you what I think Witness and Hull have got to go to Toronto it's going to be hard yeah. it's going to be really really hard for them I think home advantage is going to be crucial for Toronto here and I'd fancy them to get home advantage in the million pound game and win that game to go up let me ask you this uh, I've been very positive so far this is a slight moan from me I guess we're sat here now it's a Tuesday morning, believe it or not, despite Chris's consumption of the wine. And we don't yet know the fixtures for 
either the eights we were discussing previously or these qualifiers. We do know there will be a game next Thursday, which is on telly. So there's eight days notice for a fixture. I kind of think that Toronto, Catalan and Toulouse may well all be over in this country in the first round because otherwise the pitchforks will be out from fans over here who want to go over there. But this is this it's no this to me is no good is it well you know again going into the elite stage of the competition and you don't know who your team is going to be playing in just over a, a week's time if it was the cup fair enough because that's how cup competitions work across sports but it's got to be a bit better than that hasn't it it, it highlights the weakness of the system and the fact that again 11 of the 12 super club super league clubs don't want the system so we're about to play a system that the elite competition does not want and, the, and, and further weakness is highlighted back by eight, eight days before, before we do, we, we'll only know the fixtures. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. We want to sell this game, we want to sell it stars, we want backsides on seats. But we just make it so hard for ourselves. And that's, that's where the system doesn't work. Great, the qualifiers, fantastic. Super 8's not so great. But we've got to have something better that, that people know when you are playing at home and go to games. Again, we shoot ourselves in the foot, don't we? Because We'll all say, without a shadow of a doubt, that we've got the best product going, haven't we? The sport that we've got in rugby league, there's no better product, but uh, to say, we shoot ourselves in the foot because our planning, our administration, nobody knows what's going on, nobody can plan what they want to do, and that's where we uh, let ourselves down badly. Nothing surprises me, it's just same as, innit? You know, same as, same as. Uh, don't think that's going to change. I think every year you'll have a gripe about something we've organised that we haven't organised, right? You look at the figures from last year and, and what they've done, so... There's nothing. Until that changes, you, you will be sat in. But, but they do tail off, don't they? In the Super, in the mm. super 8, crowds tail off. It's, you know, if, if that's the climax of the season, it's, very poor, it's an anti-climax. Yeah. There's something wrong. Yeah. I don't, is it in season tickets? Forgive my ignorance. I'm not sure whether all clubs will... They, they, sh they should be, but yeah. there, seems to be, there does seem to be that drop-off because people just don't know where they are. We're going you don't know you're going to get four or three games either, it, do you? Exactly, this is it. Yeah. And plus as well, at this time of year, it's a holiday time as well for everybody mm. else, isn't it? You know, so again, the cost comes into it, Rich. We're going to talk Challenge Cup in part three. We've not quite had time uh, to do it in this part. Uh, I'm also going to get you to do a little bit of legwork, if I may, and think of a, of a burning issue that is particularly something you would like to raise on back chat and also we, we you've touched on it chris but we've not really talked about the administration of the game as i feel as though we're we're almost obliged to do at least five minutes on the running of the game and we will do that in part three as well uh, also I, I must just ask very very quickly because i like doing a prediction at the end of a part who's going to go up and who's going to go down in these qualifiers just give me some team names no no final team names Team names to, to, to go back up in yeah, Super League. Yeah. Leeds, yeah. Uh, Hulkingston Rovers, Salford, Toronto. Gary? Well, I agree with Chris. That's, not for, that's the first time, Chris, isn't it? I'm <laughs> not agreeing with you. Don't make it a bit. Mm, I can reassure sure that won't be at <laughs> Craig? Uh, I'm maybe thinking the same, but I'm thinking Toulouse have got a, a, a song to sing yet. So I'm right. thinking Toulouse in the, in the fall. A French song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched them, I watched them play at, at Newcastle this year and... They played some unbelievable stuff, defensively not good, but my God, that Ford and the way they play, mm. uh, really exciting times there. They seem together as well. So there you go, Witness fans. Uh, there's your motivation for the uh, next seven weeks. We'll see if we can give the other clubs some more motivation and look ahead to these Challenge Cup semi-finals happening this weekend in part three of Rugby League Back Chat next.
Hello and welcome back to the third and final part of this week's Rugby League Back Chat here at the Pitt Sports Bar in Chapel Allerton. Challenge Cup semi-finals this weekend. Craig, you first. Four games, four teams I should say, two games and on paper two hot favourites in St Helens, runaway leaders at the top of the Super League table and Warrington who have been very decent against Leeds who haven't so that means it's going to be the Rhinos against the Dragons in the final doesn't it? <laughs> Wow. Um, Saints are on the, on, on the season of their lifetime, aren't they? It's a bit like you said, Cass last year, and you're hoping that they don't do all this and what happened to Cass last year. I fancy it'll be a real battle. And, and Gary's just talked about it there. I think the forwards are going to get stuck straight into each other. Whoever wins that battle will win the game. The platform will be set. Catalans are not scared of mixing the game up with tactics any way they want it. They'll go any way you want it. They usually bring it brutal and start to win the penalty. It all gets a bit. So I think it'll be a feisty game, but whichever forward pack uh, I think get on top. Leeds, simple for me. Leeds have got to stop the quick play of the ball at Warrington. If they get the quick play, Warrington, good night, Irene. No doubt about it. Does Clark on the back of them forwards, Oliver. If Leeds let the, don't, don't slow that rook down and, and get their pay play. It'll be all over quick. So for me, a big challenge for Leeds will be defensively. Can they stop that roll on where Daz is making 200 metres a game on back at some big forwards? Before the season started, I said St. Tell to do the treble, but um, I'm just feeling as though Catalans are where they pack a forwards. You know, how mobile they are. I'll tell you what, they're the hardest pack of winning Super League. You look at the half pack partnership there from uh, with Drinkwater and the standoff, the combination they've got, and the pace in the back line. Gijo's back to his best at fullback. And, don't get me wrong, St. Helens have got a big pack themselves and a good mobile puck, so I'm looking forward to that confrontation between them two, but I just feel as though the confidence of what Catalans have got here, and uh, if they could keep James Robey pretty quiet, not going on the front foot, making the easy yards around the, uh, around the rook area, do you know what? I'm going for Catalan to turn St. Helens over at the weekend. I think it's going to be a classic challenge club. We need it at the semi-final, so I'm going for Catalans to turn St. over at the weekend. And the other fixture, well, it's quite simple. Can you rule Leeds out? No, you can't. You guess with the experience. But at this moment in time, fellas, they're lacking confidence. They've no leadership. They've no organisation. So there's only one winner there for mine. That's Warrington going to the Challenge Cup final. What say you, Chris? I think the Catalans game is really interesting. It reminds me of that semi-final uh, at the Halliwell Jones in 2007 when they went to play Wigan. I thought I Wigan... tipped Catalans to beat Wigan that day. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Wigan were, were odds on and, and Catalan admittedly got Stacey Jones who had the get one of the gains of his life. They were brilliant that day and they, they got to the game, the first final back at the new Wembley. Um, I bet the RFL are going, oh, I've got Catalans, that's going to be an easy sell, isn't it? So I think the, the RFL will, be, will find it quite hard work if Catalans win, with due respect to Catalans. But to be honest, it would just give a fantastic dimension again. If, to, if to, you know, going into the, into the qualifiers with Toulouse, you know, happy days for French Rugby League if they do it. I think St Helens, though, they just have that quality about them that I think that will, 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 will edge that game. I, I expect to see expect to see a St Helens Warrington um, uh, Challenge Cup final. We're not seeing one of those for a long, long time. No, it should be a good weekend. Now, what do you, the double header as well? Kind of. I know we talked yeah. about this, but I think it's a really good looks, idea. It looks yeah. good now, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. fair play to the RFL on that. I think it's a really good idea. Um, it's going to have um, network BBC television um, through, through the afternoon, and I think it's a, it's a really good concept. And by the sound of it, uh, Bolton has sold really, really yeah. well. So expect to see uh, you know probably a full full house there, which is fantastic. Yeah, buy into it, me for sure. But the only little the only little gripe I've got about it though is, um, and I say I'm involved at Keefe now and. We've got to play. We're playing this weekend. You know, the, the division one clubs. I don't know if the championship clubs are playing this weekend as well. But it should have been a weekend where rugby league was was free, so everybody can go to this event. Because now, when you look up in Cumbria, you know, if they don't support their own sides in Whitehaven, Workington, and Barrow, they support Saints, they support Wigan, they support Warrington and Leeds. There's three of them sides who were playing on Sunday, and they would have loved to have watched the Challenge Cup semi-finals. They can't do that because we are playing at the weekend. So that's only my little gripe from there where it should have been a weekend where everybody else is not playing so they can all go to that great event. But holding a Bolton as a double header, I buy into that, but it should have been a free weekend where everybody could go and watch it. We're going to finish off with each of you bringing a bit of any other business in a moment, but just a word on the administration again of the game. And um, I've sort of read it two or three times. I don't really understand it, but some suggestion that Funding allocations may be done in the future. Let me get this right, Chris, you'll put me right. On not just crowd sizes, but social media presence. Am I 
Am I getting that right? That's what the, the, the inference coming from the meeting last week is that, that funding could be dependent on, 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 uh, partly on uh, the size of your Twitter and your Facebook and Instagram, which to me is, it sounds crazy because, again, it's putting too much emphasis on, on, on the impact of social media. Um, and, uh, but that seems to be the word coming out, which, which is potentially quite frightening, I'd say, for, for clubs. If that's, if that's the criteria, it's pretty weak criteria from my point of view. It just seems, I mean, I, I think I follow every club in Championship, Championship 1 and Super League just because of what we do. I don't really see it as a way of judging... I can't, I can't get my head around it, Gary, at, at all, really. Well, to be honest with you, uh, as one uh, a lad who's from, uh, from the Ballar area, to, to be honest with you, I'm not, obviously I'm on Twitter from there, but overall, I don't really think why, why this should fit into the criteria. I don't, it should be, from a point of view, yeah, see how your club is run from a professional point of view, your sponsorship, what you got from the crowds from there. So I don't, I don't get this at all with the, uh, with the social media from there. No, I just don't buy into that. It's called framing the Facebook. Maybe that's the document they're right. going to. <laughs> I, think, I think it's going that way. I think if you look at what Bradford are doing, you can watch Bradford games on, on Facebook and, and they're looking for the impact that's going to have. I don't know how that gets the revenue into the clubs and I don't know what Bradford get for doing that. I don't know if it's just free or they get advertisements on the back of it. Do I think social media is needed? 100%. Do I think clubs should do more? 100%. Something useless. You know, some you get nothing of. You're trying to get... I, I sit and watch match day and I have my radio on and I've got everything going on to try and get as much action in my players as I can. And I look at some clubs, there's no Twitter feed. There's no thingy feed. So you, they're not even feeding the game live. There's no radio. So you think, that can't happen. If it brings all that to the fore and they actually got little ticks and said, you must get this, you must do this. You're... Fantastic. Most young people are, are social media savvy other than turning up. We've got to change that perception. But do I think people should get more money because they've got more Twitter fuzz? That's the most ridiculous comment in ever heard in a business or anything. It's ridiculous. You can buy 10,000 followers for a couple of quid. He knows. Uh, right, uh, let's <laughs> do a bit of any other business. Anything that has particularly got your goat or flirted your boat. Uh, I'm sounding very whole there, aren't I? I'm not. I'm from Scarborough. Uh, but uh, this week or, or, or over the past few weeks in rugby league, go on, Chris, you can go first. Um, uh, the, slightly personal in terms of um, myself, uh, the Times newspaper I've worked, worked for and covered rugby league and many other sports the last 26 years has decided to end principally its coverage of, of the sport. Um, it's not alone, uh, the Daily Telegraph uh, decided that many years ago and so did the Daily Mail and uh, when I first went into a, a rugby league press box, I mean Gary Schofield was playing, it's that long ago, um, and every national newspaper had a staff reporter um, covering the game. Now I know times have changed, changed and all the, the rest of it, but I think in terms of National newspapers are still very, very important for the profile and selling the sport basically in London. That's where the money is and that's where, you know, where the commercial interest is and that's what we're trying to grow in the game. And I think it's just another nail in that, in that particular coffin. And I don't think the RFL particularly helps itself. It's media, media and communications, once, once very, very good, is now very, very poor. Um, there's some changes going to happen there as well, which, 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 which I applaud. But I think it's time for, we, we talk about social media possibly kind of dictating the funding of clubs. There seems to be just too much emphasis on social media. At the end of the day, in 2021, the Sky contract ends. Everything needs to be feeding into more publicity, more commercial interest, more you know, talk about rugby league is absolutely vital for, for the sport to secure a good contract that will ensure a prosperous future and we're three years away from that now and I see no real building towards the end of that uh, towards that renewed contract if Sky indeed are going to renew and, and, and other players coming in people talk about about Facebook and talk about this but where's the actual income Sky put in 40 million pounds into the game to super basically to super league clubs and, and below it it's a huge amount of money um, and, 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 and that's the lifeblood for many clubs that's not easily replaced and that's what we're going to work towards and I think Ralph Rimmer is trying to work towards that but we've got civil strife we've got so much going on uh, 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 and, and unfortunately the wider national media is turning away from the sport can I just ask you that it feels a little bit cruel since it's so specific to you but would the times have done it if there was a want 
for it or the telegraph or the mail these newspapers print what people want to read are they yeah. not just saying we live in a little bit of a bubble yeah. sat in here around our table they and we do. all think it's a great game they do, but do we have to it, accept it, people it, don't it's not just a rugby league it's a newspapers thing as well right. and this kind of cost cutting going on so so but, but there is that thing about rugby league does seem to be shrinking perception in 1992 when i started to write about rugby league is that this is a growing sport we want to flash out the personalities the edwards the schofields the Afires the Leidens, people like that. And what we don't have at the moment are people to sell, people to kind of like talk about. Um, you know, um, people, you'd ask them, maybe somebody have heard of Sam Tompkins on the street of Leicester or, or Chesterfield or wherever go, but we don't know. With, we need mm. stars of the game to help promote the game and that's what we're lacking <coughs> at the moment. Craig, what do you want to wax lyrical about? Uh, just on the back of that, massively, I agree with what you say about players make the game, they make the coaches. Yeah. We've got to give the players more profile, get the play. We need a superstar. Simple as. Been saying this for five, ten years. Most sports, Tiger Woods, you go through every sport, yeah. Michael Jordan, transcend him. We need a superstar. But Sky did that to Sam Tompkins, then all, fans of all the other clubs just gave him stick and resentment. 100%. And then that's what needs to change. I've actually done a little thing internally with my lads saying, you know, the next time a superstar does come along, your wages are going to increase by about 25% because he'll take the revenue, as we would in golf. They won't want to back in the opens because the revenue is down millions and billions of pounds. We need to attract somebody and encourage that person to be different to what the normal, hey, wind your neck in, kid, turn your neck, all that crap's got to go out of window. We need somebody to transcend the sport. That's not even what you want to talk no, about. No, 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 no. Uh, mine's just the Yorkshire, Lancashire uh, War of Roses on Saturday, uh, under 18s, which is a direct selection for the England v Australia Test match at the end of the year. Um, the game were fantastic. The lads give everything. Just wish we could get more profile. Uh, I think on the Monday I got about 10 people ringing up saying, Craig, what, where's the game at? What time? I'm like, oh no. I started doing some Twitter feeds, asking my high profile players to tweet it out. I think there were about 80 there, and I think 60 were parents. And for me, that should have been sold as a concept. I offered 12 months ago to get involved with sponsorship, get involved in bringing that game, and asked if I could have a big input. Uh, I'm so disappointed that them kids give everything. They absolutely threw kitchen sink at it. The game won in the last 10 minutes. I guarantee you, because I ID talent for the last 13 years, there's probably five or six top line players will come through from there without any doubt. And we should be showing that to the masses. We should be encouraged in the likes of Scoey and Ellery and them to go along and maybe give each one a chat and say what it means to wear that shirt when they did. We had no history of it. We had no history of it. We had nothing going off where the real, it, it seemed like a, a secret game. Thinking, my God, we, you know, and I looked and I counted how many director rugby's went. There should have been every director of youth in the country there. Are you sacked? How dare you not turn up to the highest profile match for the under-18s in the country? Like I said, there were 60 parents. How there many directors of rugby were there? Uh, it's not, yeah, I would say if there, were, there, there were maybe five or six, but I thought there'd be scouts from all of them. I thought yeah. they all, I actually said, my God, get ready. Because if I've got a club, I'm picking some here. And there were some fantastic talents on show. And I looked at the, some of them were on one year left in the contract. So, you know, mm. it, it's buzzy. Mm. We didn't sell it. And it's such a shocking shame, again, how we can have, trying to produce this next superstar, well, on that platform, 68 people, which 60 were parents. Yeah. Um, mm. got about two minutes, Gary, for yours. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm available to mention any players, don't worry about that, Craig. But uh, I want to talk, it's from a point of view, the international calendar. The tours are coming back on, the British Lions are ready again to go to New Zealand next year, the Kangaroos are coming over in uh, 2020 again. Chris is talking about no uh, newspaper coverage. Well, at the end of the day, the pinnacle of anybody's career is playing international. If you look at all the other sports, what calendar, what they have. And I thought it was absolutely ridiculous when the Great Britain brand got lost under Richard Lewis regime from there. The tours are back on, all the players want to be tourists, they want to be a British Lion. And I know the Australians have been against the international calendar, but I'll tell you what, fellas, if they don't want to be part of an international calendar, Go tell them to get lost, because we could survive without them. There's no two ways about it. When you look at the emerging nations that are coming through, you look at Tonga, you look at Fiji, you look at Samoa, you look at Papua New Guinea from there. If Australia don't want to sell the greatest product of all, well, I'll tell you what, let them go away. Well, one thing for sure, when we do get that publicity, what we need, the product, what is out there, the Aussies will say, we want to be part of it. Don't let them bully anybody, but delighted that the international calendar's back on, the British Lions are back on, and can't wait for the kangaroos, if they do come over, in 2020, it's the pinnacle of any player's career. I think it was quite interesting seeing some figures of a crowd in Toronto 
against Featherstone compared to a crowd in Manly against Penrith this last weekend. So maybe, just maybe, there is a slight shift in, in power and thinking somewhere up the chain as far as that goes. Um, we've talked about the Challenge Cup. We've talked about the Super 8s. Um, do we finish positive? Yes or no going into this final stage of the season then as we look for our Grand Final and Challenge Cup winners? You want the Grand Final winner? No, I just want you to tell me whether you're looking forward to it, whether it <laughs> will live up to everything we've talked about. Look, when it gets to semi-finals and the final, it's great. Yeah. What we want to see, I think, is a proper playoff series. And I think, we're, we, we, you know, that, that, that's what we're lacking at the moment. Yeah. But when it comes to the end of the season, it'll be great. Five seconds. Th this weekend, the Challenge Cup, the biggest cup competition in World yeah. Rugby League. Can't wait for it. Yeah, Craig, thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, thumbs up, 100%. Marvellous stuff. Well, time has beaten us again this week. If you'd like to know what else is coming up on this channel, uh, go to www.freesports.tv. Well, that's all from me, Craig Harrison, Gary Schofield and Chris Irvine. Rugby League Back Chat is back next week, but from this week's edition, thanks for watching and goodbye.